Good morning. Welcome to Stand on the Word. Thanks for joining me. All right, before we get started, just want to let you know we have a new resource available for you. It is a study guide for Ephesians. It's a seven-day study guide. We're actually going to be in the book of Ephesians next week. But if you'd like to get a copy, you can go to frc.org slash Ephesians, and you can order either a copy online or a hard copy. So today we're in Acts chapters 23 and 24. And the question is this, are you resting on or acting upon the promises of God? What we see from Paul here is that Paul, when the Lord spoke to him, he acted on the word of the Lord. He didn't rest on the word of the Lord. Verse 11 of chapter 23, but the following night the Lord stood by him, that is Paul, and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Now, in these chapters, we have the continuation of Paul in Jerusalem and the beginning of his journey to Rome. Now, this chapter begins with Paul speaking to the religious council uh, and the local commander having to uh, try to come in, determine what the issue was, why there was so much controversy. Well, as a Pharisee, Paul knew that there were areas of division between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So Paul blows up this entire meeting. Verse 6. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say there is no resurrection, no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Well, how did this whole thing end? Verse 10, Now, when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. So this then sets the stage for what happens next. Verse 11, But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Now, this was a message of both confirmation and courage from the Lord. Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Paul was finally going to Rome just as he said he wanted to back in Acts chapter 19. Just not the way he had planned on going. But now he knew without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord was in this. It was not a mistake for him to come to Jerusalem and be bound up. This was God's plan. So did Paul rest on this word from the Lord or did he act upon it? Well, let's look at verse 12. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now, there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, this conspiracy is exposed. Now, somehow Paul's nephew finds out about this. He heard it. He comes and he tells Paul about their plan to kill him. Verse 16, so when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So Paul's nephew is taken to the commander and he tells him about this conspiracy. Verse 22, so the commander let the young man depart, commanded him saying, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. And he called for two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. Now, here's what happens. The plot to kill Paul, it's foiled. Paul gets a small army, along with government transportation, to take him on the first leg of his journey to Rome. Now, as with almost any chapter of the Bible, there are many, many truths that we can uh, take away from this. But here's what I want us to focus on in this first chapter. The Lord appears to Paul and told him, take courage. All right, take courage. You're going to Rome to testify of me. Was this encouragement then for Paul just to sit back and, you know, just say, hey, I'm just going to let things fall into place? Or was it a message 
of encouragement to Paul to act in concert with the will and the purposes of God. Well, from Paul's action, I think it's clear that it was the latter. To borrow from James chapter 2, but do you not know, O foolish man, that work, that faith without works is dead? Our faith in God and in His promises should encourage us and propel us to take actions to see God's purposes accomplished in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Now next, Paul is taken to Caesarea to Felix the governor of Judea. The Jewish rulers come before Felix and they have a hired gun to make their case against Paul, a lawyer, uh, Tertullus, most likely a Roman lawyer. So Tertullus butters up Felix and then tries to make Paul an enemy of the state. Look what they say in verse 5 of chapter 24. For we have found this man a plague, wow, a coronavirus, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now, after all of that, Paul has an opportunity to respond to their charges. In this case, in this case in Jerusalem, he had, he, he had not even preached in Jerusalem. I mean, just his presence was enough to create an uproar. Now, sometimes, now, this is instructive, because sometimes opposition simply comes out of left field. I mean, you're like, where in the world did that come from? But here's the reality. As the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit increases in our lives, expect the challenges, the temptations, and the persecution of the enemy to increase as well. Verse 12. As, and they neither found me in the temple, disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogue or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Now, after these many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if there had been anything against me. Or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless, listen to this, unless it is for the, this one statement which I cried out standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. So Paul once again hits that button that divides the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Felix does not make a decision. He says he will wait until the commander comes and provides additional testimony. But the rest of the passage reveals that there's more to this than meets the eye. What we have here is a corrupt politician who's looking to line his own pockets and further his own political career. Roman historian Tacitus describes Felix as ruling with a mixture of cruelty, lust, and servility. Drusilla, that we'll read in this passage, was the second of his uh, three wives. Drusilla was Jewish. She was the daughter of Herod Agrippa, who Herod Agrippa was struck by the angel of the Lord because he did not give glory to God. We read that in Acts chapter 12. And she was brother to Herod Agrippa II that we'll soon be introduced to. So Drusilla divorced her first husband to marry Felix. Now being educated in the Jewish religion, she was probably inquisitive of what was happening here with Paul. So notice how God is using this journey to Rome to take the gospel all the way up the chain of command. Paul was taking the gospel not just to the Gentiles, but he's taking it now to governors and to kings. Paul was acting upon the word that the Lord had given him. Verse 23 of chapter 24, So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have his liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for him or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. 
But after two years, Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So it says here that Paul reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Now, obviously, that struck a nerve with Felix. Felix was afraid. In other words, he was convicted of his sin. But it was a conviction that did not lead to repentance. He answered, go away for now, and when I have a convenient time, I will call for you. A convenient time? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul writes this. He says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, as best as we can tell from Scripture and from the historical record, Felix never found that convenient time. And so he died in his sin, separated from God, going into eternity, into hell. Now, this may be an inconvenient truth, but it's one that we will all face. We need to accept by faith the grace that God has extended to us through Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that the promises that you have given us, that we would act upon them. We would not be passive just sitting around, but we would act upon them in line with your word, with your will, with your purposes and your plans. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Again, thanks for being with me today. I would encourage you, share this with your friends. Like it on Facebook if you're watching on Facebook. If you're on the website, uh, share it with others so that they can be a part of our journey through the Bible. Until next time, keep standing on the Word.